Hammerlund HQ 100A version 1, 1959-1962, modified. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project available in video and in written form made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. The models HQ100 and 100A have been relatively cheaper in the larger family of expensive receivers produced by Hammerlund. The HQ100 appeared first, with a single circuit for the Q multiplier and BFO oscillator, while the HQ100A divided those functions so that they could be used simultaneously. The model HQ100A, like its predecessor, was using cheap IF transformers that by now have developed silver mica disease, and in the first version, a fuse was still missing. The item under restoration was significantly modified, particularly with the intention of improving the SSB detection, choosing between different alternatives. Clearly, a lot of passion was poured into it, but from today's point of view, mostly the result is a chassis and a cabinet full of scars. There were also unused holes and planned holes, showing that it all was an important process. It is remarkable the usage of sheet of copper for making the internal subchassis, and also the fact that this subchassis contained unused holes as well suggesting a different initial project. Once it was determined the general function of the last modification, a plan was made to reduce it to a more sane arrangement, which will be described later. Anyhow, during all the stages of the restoration of this particular item, cleaning has been a continuous and progressing process, involving the space above the chassis but also under the chassis. In the beginning it has been necessary to use a degreasing solvent, commonly used as stain remover, to clean the chassis. Later, a rust remover gel has been used to get rid of the stains of rust and other signs of corrosion. The original documentation for this receiver is available from BAMA, Boat Anchor Manual Archive, as well as from other sites. This is the original schematic diagram of the model HQ100A, first version. It should be observed that the BFO oscillator uses a 6BV8 tube, which also incorporates two signal diodes, one of which is used for the detection. The BFO circuit itself does not show how it is coupled in the detection stage, which implies that this is meant to happen just inside the tube due to the proximity with the detection diode. Another important detail to observe about the tube type 6BV8 is that the filament is powered with a 3.3 ohms resistor in series, which would reduce slightly the current available to it. However, in this particular item that has been so much modified, which does not have a tube type 6BV8 anymore, the SSB product detector of the model HQ200 will be used instead. Therefore, 
The final schematic diagram for the item under restoration will be this one, and some details will be explained later. After an initial important cleaning phase, it is possible to remove some unnecessary parts that have been added to this unit before trying to power the unit on. For example, this is a pair of abandoned wires, the original purpose of which remains unknown. Then an early test with dim bulb and isolation transformer is done, verifying if the local oscillator is still okay. Luckily, the result is comforting, and the process of removal of unnecessary parts can continue with better confidence. It might be interesting to observe that the carrier signal meter circuit was modified for the purpose of adjusting also the maximum value. The circuit for the carrier signal meter was initially restored as prescribed by the original schematics using a fixed resistor, R17, and without the diode that was added to prevent from reverse currents. But later, because the meter was too often traversed by a reverse current, it has been necessary to increase the value of R15, and for this it has been sufficient to add a resistor like it is visible in this diagram. At this point, the receiver is still OK, and also a station can be received. It will be found later that the crackling noise comes from a short in the blades of the variable capacitor. While the original schematic diagram does not include a fuse, this modified unit had one, but the fuse holder was located on the chassis in a very questionable place. According to the writing visible outside, it should have been a 1 amp slow blow, but the actual fuse inside was rated fast 15 amps, which is a lot more even if it is a fast blow. Anyhow, two fuses have been put in place instead to protect both power lines against shorts, regardless of the polarization of the power plug, and the fuse holders have been located into holes that remained unused after pruning most of the former modifications. The power cord was replaced with a new one that includes an earth wire, which is now connected directly to the chassis. The new power cord was fixed to the chassis using three grommets, to make sure that it cannot move. The first one as large as the hole. Two smaller grommets on the cord, one inserted before and one after the hole. The external grommet has been pushed towards the cord end, remaining outside the hole. The three grommets have been glued with super glue to themselves, to the power cord, to the chassis. In the end, the cord could not be pulled pushed nor turned. The capacitors C43 and C44 were still original, in very good shape and of very good quality. Nevertheless, they have been replaced with modern class Y safety capacitors. The capacitor CAN C38, which contained three electrolytic elements, has been removed to install new components. It seemed appropriate to refill the CAN but for the purpose a different and smaller can has been used. Because the same values were not available, something slightly different has been put in place. 33 microfarads for the first filter capacitor instead of 40. 47 microfarads for the second instead of 60. 27 microfarads for the cathode bypass capacitor instead of 25. 
the resistor R20 between the last filter capacitor and the voltage regulator tube, which now would be floating around, was secured with the help of a small tag strip. Later, at the end of the restoration, it was necessary to do something to drop some voltage from the AC external supply because the power transformer was made for a slightly lower voltage than what the mains provides today. And, in fact, the tube filament voltage appeared slightly higher than it should be. Therefore, three halogen light bulbs have been inserted to drop some voltage and to control the initial surge of current while turning on the receiver. A small board has been used for installing the halogen light bulb sockets, suspending it over the chassis with the purpose of letting the heat dissipate more easily. A combination of 360 watts light bulbs in parallel was chosen, making 180 watts in total. Under the circumstances, it was possible to install fuses type F200 milliamps because without the initial current surge, they would not blow until about 1.6 amps. As mentioned before, one section of the tuning variable capacitor was shorting. It was precisely the oscillator section. After resolving the issue, I decided to replace the screws holding the stator blades with stainless steel equivalents. The original screws were all rusty. They have been treated with a rust remover. Therefore, that rust does not appear in this clip. But I wasn't sure that the rust would not have developed again later. And I didn't want to take the chance. These screws are type U and C632. Before going any further, it is important to make sure to have the right alignment tools. The original documentation specifies precisely what should be used. Today, instead of general cement, the company is called GC Electronics, and those tools are still listed in their catalog. If that were necessary, the first tool, the GC5097, used for the IF alignment, could be made using the plastic stem of a very small paintbrush. Very likely, while using this homemade tool, its tip would be consumed, and it would be necessary to rework it with a small file. What matters the most is that the ferrite core must be harder than the tool, because the former would be irreplaceable. As for the second tool, the GC8282, it is not plausible to think of making it at home, because it has an hexagonal head on a stem that is thinner, so that the head can be inserted further to tune another core underneath. And also the quality of the plastic becomes crucial, because it must be particularly soft and elastic. For this restoration, the tool RS543-147 has been used. It is possible that an equivalent of the GC8282 tool has imperfections. They may be irrelevant, but in this case, they were corrected with a small file before inserting the hexagonal head inside the ferrite cores. This is a sequence of clips showing in detail the process of restoration of the IF transformers using NP0 capacitors for replacement. These clips show only the work done on T7, the last IF transformer, which is the first, that was restored. Later, also T6 and T5 in this order have been restored and tested in the same way. The IF transformer is cleaned. The radio must have been stored in a very dusty place, and that dust also entered the IF cans.
the cores are moved to a safer position. Then, very carefully the rivet at the bottom is cut until it is possible to remove it. Now that the rivet is removed, the mica sheets can be extracted. The small metal flaps used to make contact with the mica sheets should be slightly lifted to do the job. This is the visible effect of the deterioration of these silver mica sheets. The metal flaps are bent to separate them and leave enough space for the NP0 capacitors to be installed. The leads connected to these flaps are loose, and it is important to secure them with some super glue so that they cannot move. The excesses of the metal flaps are cut. Please notice that, while cutting them, these pieces of metal become very small projectiles and one should wear or have some eye protection. It is now time to take inductance measurements and it is important to verify that there is no significant difference if the IEF transformer is outside or inside the can. It is necessary to measure the max inductance.
corresponding to the ferrite cores completely inserted, like it has been done so far, but also the minimal inductance, corresponding to the ferrite cores completely extracted. The schematic diagram shows the values that the original mica capacitors should have had. However, it is not guaranteed that these supposed values would work well, and it also might be difficult to find exactly those values with relatively high insulation voltage NP0 capacitors. In other words, measuring the inductances for all the IEF transformers under restoration is always necessary to decide what capacitor values to choose. It is now time to calculate the corresponding capacitances at each extreme, where a resonance of about 455 kHz could be obtained. During this measurement and calculation process, a table like this one should be populated, including also the chosen values for the capacitors to be installed. Some solder is applied to the ends of the trimmed flaps. The surface mount and P0 capacitors of the chosen values are prepared and soldered. Before putting back the IF transformers in their can, I decided to put some light grease to reduce the friction while turning the ferrite cores. However, I am not sure if this is a good practice.
Once the IEF transformer is back in its can, the can is tightened and then installed on the chassis. For now the IF transformer is soldered only making temporary connections that could be easily undone because it is necessary to verify that it can actually tune comfortably to the expected frequency. To test the IF transformer and get the initial alignment a 455 kHz non-modulated signal coming from the signal generator is injected at the input of the preceding tube like the picture shows seeking for the most negative voltage measured between the cathode of the noise limiter diode and the chassis ground. In this modified version of the receiver, it is pin 1 of the 6AL5. If it is possible to peak the output signal without reaching the end on both ferrite core paths, the chosen capacitors are OK and the connections can be fixed with better soldering. Otherwise, if the result is not satisfactory, the IEF transformer should be removed again and one or both capacitors would have to be changed with different values. If the ferrite core has been completely inserted, the corresponding capacitor value should be increased. If the opposite happened, the corresponding capacitor value should be reduced. The original function switch was not available anymore on the unit under restoration and in its place a big four deck switch was installed. Because that extra space would be needed later for the current limiting light bulbs, the original smaller switch was rebuilt using a regular three pole, four position rotary switch, also known as three poles, four throws. However, the new switch has a shaft that is a little bit shorter than the original and it has been necessary to install it closer to the front panel replacing the original mounting bracket with a new one adapted for the purpose. The regular IF alignment is done for all the three IF transformers injecting a non-modulated signal of 455 kHz at pin 7 of V2. The negative voltage at the end of the noise limiter diode and the chassis ground is measured with a voltmeter to obtain the most negative value. Pin 8 of the original 6BV8, but pin 1 of the 6AL5 in this modified version. The intensity of the 455 kHz signal is kept to a minimum value, just enough to be able to do the alignment to avoid overloading the system. However, the receiver is configured for receiving with about 75% sensitivity, manual volume control, frequency range 0.54, 1.6, noise limiter off, audio gain at zero, selectivity off, main tuning 0.54 MHz, band spread 100. The IF transformers are aligned accessing above and under the chassis. The cores accessible from above, the chassis are related to the secondary windings. Those accessible under the chassis correspond to the primary. It is possible to obtain a visual representation of the quality of the alignment, also with cheap digital equipment, using an unmodulated, slowly sweeping signal around the value of 455 kHz, visualizing the DC negative voltage at the output of the noise limiter diode on a digital oscilloscope with a slow horizontal scan. The bell curve would appear upside down because the IEF transformers would be peaked in correspondence of the most negative value read by the oscilloscope. However, while trying this method before connecting the oscilloscope probe, one should verify first that the voltage corresponds to what is expected. In other words, if the oscilloscope probe is connected to another point with high voltage, the oscilloscope could be destroyed. 
after the IF transformers are correctly aligned, it is time to align the Q multiplier frequency, injecting the same non-modulated signal at the same position like for the IF alignment. The purpose is to get the maximum resonance around 455 kHz when the knob of the Q multiplier frequency is indicating the middle position. There is a stop lug that prevents the shaft from rotating continuously, which is held in place by a bushing nut. This can be released so that the stop lug would not obstruct the movement of the shaft, fixing the stop lug later in the chosen position. Alternatively, the stop lug could be left where it is, and the ring around the shaft can be released so that the long screw inserted in it would not stop the movement of the shaft. With the Q multiplier on and the selectivity turned clockwise just before the oscillating point, the frequency shaft is turned to get the maximum output signal corresponding to the most negative value. At the end of the alignment, that position of the frequency shaft should correspond to the knob indicator in the middle position. Without rotating the shaft, the stop lug or the ring around the shaft should be placed and locked where it would allow an evenly distributed rotation clockwise and counterclockwise with the point of maximum in the middle. The unit under restoration has a modified BFO circuit, but the alignment of the beat frequency oscillator is done in the same way as for the original one. When the BFO is used, Ideally, the oscillator should produce exactly 455 kHz when the corresponding knob is indicating zero. For the BFO alignment, injecting the same non-modulated signal at the same position like for the IF alignment, the receiver is set for using the BFO, and the selectivity of the Q multiplier is turned off. The BFO knob should be set to zero and that must correspond to the variable capacitor C59 half meshed. The sensitivity control is set to a value below overload. Then, the coil L7 just behind the BFO frequency control is adjusted for zero beat. In this case, raising the volume slightly to allow listening to the beat frequency could make the alignment easier. At this point of the overall alignment procedure, it is also appropriate to take care of the signal meter indicator. First of all, it should be mechanically zeroed. Then, according to the original documentation, with the AVC activated, the sensitivity at the maximum level, pin 1 of V5 grounded and no signal input, the potentiometer R15 at the rear of the chassis should be adjusted to obtain a zero value on the meter. However, if the cabinet is already installed, without shorting to ground pin 1 of V5, it is possible to just short the antenna input. The result might not give the same accuracy. This way, it is much easier to do. This receiver has three stages in the RF section, the antenna, the RF preamplifier, and the oscillator. However, the lower frequency band has no RF preamplifier, the alignment starts from the lower frequency band and progresses up to the higher frequency. The coils are accessible completely from above the chassis, but in the RF preamplifier and in the oscillator sections, there are two ferrite cores in each can. Therefore, a special tool is necessary for the alignment, as described earlier in this video. For the model HQ100A, the trimmer capacitors used in the oscillator section are accessible from above the chassis. Removing and putting aside the BFO circuit that is installed above them on the front panel, while those used by the RF preamplifier are accessible from under the chassis. The detailed procedure is described in the original documentation, but is also available in the written documentation that comes along with this video. In short, it is verified that the dial wheels can travel the entire extension of their scale. 
otherwise their orientation should be adjusted in relationship to the respective variable capacitor shaft. The antenna terminal A2 is shorted with the ground terminal. Then the receiver is set like in the picture, where the band spread indicator is aligned to 100 on the log scale. The required signal is loosely coupled with the antenna input, and the intensity of the signal is regulated keeping it as low as possible. The signal can be non-modulated, but if it is modulated it can be heard from the loudspeaker, making the procedure slightly easier. Except for one case, all the adjustments are done seeking for the most negative voltage measured between the cathode of the noise limiter diode and the chassis ground. If possible, it is important to verify that the actual oscillator frequency is above the signal that is used for the alignment. Then the alignment could proceed following these charts, which in turn refer to the map of adjustable components that was shown previously. For every band, the procedure is repeated until the lower and upper part of the dial appear reasonably aligned. There are two rotating dials on this receiver, one for the tuning variable capacitor and the other one for the band spread or fine tuning. The shafts connected to the external knobs transfer the movement to the dials, which rotate the shafts of the respective variable capacitors. On the upper part of the front panel, there are also some plastic washers used to keep these dial wheels correctly aligned vertically in front of the respective dial glasses. The removal and reinstallation of the front panel requires attention to the correct insertion of the dial wheels in the upper side. These snapshots have been borrowed from the restoration of the model HQ100. While removing or reinstalling the front panel, one should keep in mind that the two lever switches should be released or fixed on the panel operating from the internal nut while the external ring should be rotated only using fingers. The cabinet of the item under restoration had signs of rust and corrosion and therefore it has been submerged in vinegar for some days until the rust was dissolved and the old paint became soft and started to detach. Then the cabinet has been brushed and resubmerged in vinegar various times along more days to make sure that all the residues of paint were completely removed. Finally, it was cleaned, washed and painted, starting from a first coat of zinc paint and finished with the final coats of the chosen color. The largest holes on the upper part have been filled with stainless screws and nuts. Apropos holes, also the last unused holes on the back of the chassis have been covered with a zinc plate for safety reasons. The plate has been soldered using a low temperature alloy containing bismuth and tin. Compared to the previously restored model HQ100, the writings on the front panel of the item under restoration appeared more resistant to cleaning. However, there were important signs of corrosion that ruined the paint. So, the panel has been stripped using acetone. Please notice that the front panel is made of cast aluminum, which is not suitable for soaking in vinegar. Then, it has been painted with the same type of acrylic color used for the perforated cabinet, but with a slightly lighter tone. Because of the very decent result with the 3D labels used in the restoration of the HQ100, in this case the same thing has been done using transparent labels though. The original aluminum plate covering the big hole that could have been used for installing a 24-hour clock was scratched and drilled. Another zinc plate has been cut and attached, this time using glue. On the back panel, also some information will be added for safety. Even though water decals have not been used in this restoration, 
in the written documentation that comes along with this video. The original writings have been redrawn and are available for printing. Here is the collection of replaced parts. The screws found in this unit were generally of type UNC. Only the S meter used metric screws. The Hammerlund HQ100A is ready. The test is done in the evening, close to midnight, using an indoor wire antenna, and it starts from the higher frequency band proceeding down to the medium wave band. The last position of the band switch selector 20BS is not used for this test because it is only a variant of the band 1030 MHz, especially dedicated to the 14 MHz. On this occasion, near the 20-meter band, it is possible to listen to a number station. This unit, which has been modified with a product detector, detects SSB communication correctly only if the AVC is activated. Zero five. 
In the 40 meter band, it is also possible to listen to some ham radio communication. The following is a story that a friend of mine told me. This is a story that I like, but neither my friend nor I can tell if it is true or how accurate it can be, with no possibility of verifying any part of it, because I have lost contact with the person who gave me this radio. In a restoration process of an old technological item, there are different aspects that might be in conflict. The aim of bringing the object back to its original condition like new. The need of making it safer. The desire of preserving the history of it. To fully satisfy the last of these intentions, the item should just remain intact, including the dust. While to return the item back to its original shine, all the memory associated with it should be erased. Keeping some record of what happened to the item and around it would probably be better than keeping the dust, and would give meaning and add value to the condition of an item that is not original anymore.
So here is a story, something to keep with the radio, maybe to tell to a guest on occasion of a Halloween evening. The name of the owner of this radio who made all these changes might have been John. He went to war in World War II while he was a very young man where he lost a foot. He was a locksmith, but eventually his war injury obliged him to retire early from this job living very poor. He liked radios and he taught himself to repair radios. He started repairing radios as a hobby for the people in his neighborhood, and so he could earn a little bit extra by doing that. However, those people were also not very wealthy, so often they repaid John for the repairs in the way they could. He once repaired a radio for a woman who could not give anything to him in return. She was friends with another woman who was a cook in a noble house. The owner of the house died, and the son commissioned a company to clear the house and liquidate its content. Before the house had been cleared, the cook asked the heir about this radio, which at that time was not functioning anymore. He accepted, and the cook could have this radio, but that in exchange of her severance pay. Anyway, she wasn't expecting to receive a severance payment for her service, so she accepted the deal. The cook and her friend brought the radio to John as a sign of gratitude because he not only repaired the radio of this single woman, but also often lent a hand and helped her whenever he could. And that is how this radio came into his possession. He enjoyed it, also modifying it in various ways. This radio was for him at the same time like a beloved partner and his masterpiece. When he died, a man who had a claim on him, maybe his landlord, stopped by his house and just got something out of it that could have some value. This man took the radio along with all the tools that John had for the radio repair and went to a pawn shop specialized in electronics where he got the money that John owed him. In the pawn shop, the radio was more or less gathering dust in the storeroom because at that time nobody was interested in vacuum tube radios anymore. At some point the heir of the owner of this shop cleared out the storage rooms after the shop had been abandoned for a long time. So eventually the radio was given to me and I restored it in the way that this video describes. If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment or old radios in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production, 